program where we blitz modern art. We talk about the most interesting, what do you want to say? The most interesting things. I wanted to come up with a better word than things. things. The most interesting, interesting events and people. Presentations and representations of art and the art spirit here in Los Angeles, California. And around the world. On occasion. Uh, my name is Matt Gleason. I'm your host for one hour of Modern Art Blitz. My co-host next to me, the lovely Lisa Derrick. And uh, joining us today in the Skechers seat, our intern, Aliza. Hi, Aliza. Hi, Aliza. Now, now are, are you're gonna be here next week, right? Not next weekend. Are, ne you're not gonna be here next weekend, because where are you gonna be? In France. You're gonna be in France. And what will you be, where in France? In Nice. Nice, you're um, not going to Paris? No. And what are you gonna be doing in, in Nice, Keep which is up. so nice? What, what's, what's, is nice, is Nice gonna be nice? I think so. Oh yeah? I hope, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm you know, there is a place in France where the ladies wear no pants. Everywhere? That's a, oh, that's so, okay, never <laughs> mind. <more. laughs> what, what are you gonna be doing in Nice? Um, I'm taking, a, well, I'm gonna be doing work for an exhibition in August. Wow, so you're So you're gonna, making art and you're gonna show art? Yeah. So you're going all that way for a solo show? Well, yeah. Is it a group show? Or solo no, it's a show? group show. And is is this with your college? No, it's a it's a CSU program, but Cal it's State not, University, yeah. California State University. Any any CSU student could have gone. Right. Any CSU art well, student. Well, you have to submit an application and portfolio. Also. So they already looked at your portfolio and said you look pretty French. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. So you're going to be sketching our guest who will be up with us in a minute, the great Ron Athey. But before that, we have to do our weekly feature, Who Died This Week? Lisa, who died this week? Well, I'm really heartbroken over the death of Robin Hardy, the director of Wicker Man. Robin Hardy. Never heard of him. But you've her? heard of him. It's a him. 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 Robin him. is a boy's name and a girl's name. Yes, it is. Okay. It's an androgynous so, name. So there's a guy, the androgynous director of what? The Wicker Man, this, the erotic pagan mystery that was eventually remade with Nicolas Cage, but it, but it had Christopher Lee in it, and it was about he's the, in everything. I know he's you can't so do a, he's uh, so awesome. Christopher yeah. Lee freaking rocks. So anyway, in the Wicker Man, there's a mysterious death, and a policeman goes to investigate, and he's seduced by Britt Eklund, and discovers. The mystery of Summervale, I think it's called Summerland Island, and the 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 strange lord who rules it, and the apple fields and the beehives, and it's a kind of a matriarchal society, and it has to do with the dying and reviving God. This sounds and like Lord of the Rings with women. No, no, no. It's more Brit, like Brit no. It's more like. Golden Bow with women, you know, oh. phrase. Anyway, it's it's super sexy. There's this scene where these two snails are mating in the rain, and it's like all like who who played the snails? <laughs> they they were cameo appearances. Cameo appearances. Yeah, by by, by, by Shell and Shelley. Shell and Shelley. Oh, that was good. That was good. Oh, she's on. She's on. She's sharp tonight. So who else died this week? Michael Cimino. Michael Cimino. You know, I actually started watching Heaven's Gate once years ago. Have you finished it yet? You know, I couldn't. It was like, come on. It was, it, it was beautiful. I was not at a theater. It was on a big. It was on a very large TV, but still, it was it, it was beautifully filmed. But oh man, I mean, Deer Hunter is kind of a long. I think that's one of the longer movies to ever right. win Best Picture. But Heaven's Gate. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, you win Best Picture. 
and then you're remembered for the movie afterwards that flopped, that bankrupted, right. lot, you know, hundred million dollars. It's still better than Ishtar. It, well, okay, okay. So, <laughs> and then, um, so who else died this week? Well, Matt, the world's oldest photography studio closed, and that's a pretty significant death. The world's oldest photography studio. It's in India. It is in India or was in India? It was in India. Okay. In a, and not in Mumbai either. It was in a very small, in a not so well known town called Kolkata, India. And it started 176 years ago. 176. I'm going to do my math now. We could be a while. 100 years ago, it was 2016, or it was 1916. So 76 years before 1916. Oh, shit. What is it? Come on. Math is hard. I don't know. Okay, 50 a long years, time ago. 50 years earlier than that would have been 1866. Six. So 10 more years. years, 20 more years, 1846. Wow. Or so. And they just closed. 1840. Yeah, they, they just, just closed. closed. That's kind of a good run. Yeah, you know? it is. But you wonder, and, but, and, and you wonder how many people still haven't picked up their film. <laughs> you took you know the, you, I mean? yeah, exactly. Okay. Was that your line? Yeah. <laughs> 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 We've got to get those, those. There's some old man. My my early pictures are in here. Exactly. Um, but you so. know what killed it? The iPhone. The iPhone, Instagram. They have Instagram, Instagram in India. They do. They do. They, they do. Have, it's, 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 it's worldwide. It's India is one of the few democracies out there. You know, so the people there vote with their with their uh, likes and clicks and stuff. But you even know? on the um, even on the the plains where the Maasai live in Kenya and Tanzania. Yeah. They have cell phones and they have but remote they, banking. They don't have 146-year-old photo studios. No, they don't. They don't. So what was the name of the studio? It was called, let me, uh -oh. Born and Shepherd. Born and Shepherd. I have a feeling, I have a feeling. They're going to be reborn and Shepherd? I have a feeling that this is not the last Born and Shepherd we hear from. Right. It kind of, and Born is spelled the same way as the Born identity, which. Jason Born. Born, exactly, uh, which lips. will be. So, yes. so who else died? Who else died? Yeah, go down the list. Go down the list here. Oh my gosh. There was one other person I wanted you to talk about, but you you you, oh, you skipped Ely over. Oh, Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel died. Eli Wiesel. I, I could spell it, but it's hard to pronounce. It's very hard to pronounce, and it's a great loss to. He it was a Nobel Prize winner, so you kind of have to. If you win the Nobel Prize, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a pretty. Uh, um, glowing obituary, right? Has there ever been a Nobel Prize winner who like everybody ended up hating? Well, besides Obama. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Buddy Ryan died. Buddy Ryan died. He died. Yeah, that's right. He died June 28th. Tell us about, wasn't he an NFL coach? Yeah. He, Is that I just, football? Most people like to complain about Buddy Ryan. What team did he coach for? The Green uh, Bay Packers? No, he did not. No, no, no. no. I, never, I never cared for Buddy the Ryan. Ravens? Buddy, the thing about Buddy Ryan is he was a defensive whiz, and he, and he created the defense for the 1985 Chicago Bears who won the Super Bowl. The Bears? So, yeah. And then he tried to recreate his success in other places like the, the star-crossed Philadelphia Eagles, and it just never worked out. So there you go. Sports on Modern Art Blitz. Yeah, this is just... Somewhere behind the pearly gates, there's a team not scoring because Buddy Ryan's coaching the defense. Maybe, maybe he's playing against the wicker man. I don't know. Could, could we just talk about who our guest is today? Our guest today. I'm going to introduce him now. Why don't you introduce our guest? Oh, my gosh. Our guest. Could your introduction outdo my introduction? Let's see. Well, it might. Elisa, you're going to be the judge of the introductions. If our guest doesn't walk on, we know we didn't do a good introduction. <laughs> our guest today yes. is the internationally renowned and acclaimed. You can be renowned and acclaimed. Yes, you can. Can you be acclaimed and not renowned? Yes. Okay, just yes. making sure. Yes, they're, they're not synonymous. Synonymous. Performance artist. Performance artist. And author. Author. And all around um, just inspirational presence presence on the scene beyond the scene beyond the scene i'm talking internationally and who is it ron athey who i have to say many many years ago in 1992 you did a benefit performance <laughs> for a fundraiser i was doing and that's when i first met you the introduction is over have a seat <laughs> and i'm like i'm and it's so Welcome to Modern yeah. Art Blitz, Ron yeah. Athey. This is wow. like, so, like. And of course, Internaliza will be sketching you Ooh. from the sketcher's seat. 
So, uh, Ron, welcome. Oh, Ron, take off your shoes. Oh, no, leave your shoes on. <laughs> I'm only saying that because it's all scuffed up. Oh, it's all scuffed up. If okay. everybody else had abided, and you know what? I don't have a problem. But Ron, Ron, gets, Ron is an exception. I'm wearing my favorite summer sandals. So summer yeah. sandals? Yes, they're very cool. So, um, Ron, uh, let's, let's start in. We've got a lot to talk about. You have had a, an epic career. And I don't want and to. And are still uh, having one. And, and and you're in the middle of it. We're just we're just getting started here in, in a way. This is your mid-career kind of like check-in point, okay? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us what you're working on right now. I just want to go back and say everybody over 50 knows that they're well past the halfway point <laughs> the of their life. <laughs> that was a, I hit that so, speed bump. <laughs> so maybe up 10 years. <laughs> I say that every 10 years. <laughs> so, so tell us what you're working on right now. Right now I'm working on trying to figure out how to do something in the States. Well, the States are, we're, we're troubled here, you know. There's Griff, so. Have you ever, uh, <laughs> a, a, have you ever applied for a big fat grant? I haven't yet. You've never applied for not a grant? Here. Not in the United States? Well, oh, well, once I played for 10 in a row, and the last one wasn't so fat, was the Franklin Furnace like, grant to, to travel and perform in New York and make a new piece and everything, all for 5000 and, I, and oh. I didn't get that one. So I, I wrote poor Martha a letter like, Martha! <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, while, you know, it's always the other side, while like, getting rights from a video from me. So I thought, okay, ah. I'm still on the blacklist from the boring 90s NEA stuff. So um, anyway, I'm, you're, you're I'm, not on uh, Jesse Holmes' Christmas card I'm list. I'm back working with uh, um, uh, um, Jennifer Doyle is helping me produce the Gifts oh. of the Spirit, which is um, you know me branching more into um, esoteric studies, the kind of cross section between Pentecostalism and spiritualism. Wow, were you raised Pentecostal? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so with a lot of um, spiritualist tricks, like okay. The, scrying um wow automatic writing so you're going to get more than just you are going to be involved in this yep so i i'm almost i'm the timekeeper this is i've done only the automatic writing parts in in england and london manchester and birmingham um and then i did a version at um participant inc in new york city but i'm you know this is going to be the 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 full piece and it today this takes about 30 people and a few days of workshopping. To get everybody ready to do the automatic writing? To get them, I always require the writers have to know they can do like um, stream of consciousness writing or ecstatic writing. So we try to like bump that up with, with um, use of a, a hypnotist during the rehearsals. And then the other thing is about um, how to be in it while people are walking alongside you and getting down on their knees and looking at what you're doing you know the gawk factor so we have people ah. constantly walking around while they're so you want to get them into state. kind of a yeah. mental state that that's going to allow them to continue doing this because in, in the this writing machine they're going to do a they do a collectively authored text which is um, ah. there's typists and then it goes to cut up editors to do kind of a random algorithm of all the writings wow so uh, and this is and this is kind of like sounding a little a little higher tech than most Pentecostalism. Oh sure, it's a. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to be? Have you ever done any of this? Uh, have you ever charmed snakes? No, no, I don't feel snakes. No, no, no snakes. And then uh, and what's the what's the other one? Do you speak in tongues? I do. You do? Do you speak in tongues during your performances? I have. You have. I I, I did a um a operatic duo drama with Juliana Snapper, and we did a. A glossolalia call and respond. So, glossolalia is you know unhinged. You, you, I don't have to give it an explanation whether you're channeling anything or not, but it's about r reaching a, a spastic nervous state where you utter all kinds of god awful noises. Oh yeah. Whereas um, bel canto, you've erased your break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you have an automatic jump to the next sound, so you never go into that. <laughs> You can't sing Jolene if your life depends on it. Oh, no. Okay. You're, 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 you're way past comprehension. Yeah, no more bluegrass for you. No. <laughs> what is this? I think I saw this piece or a version of it at um, Human Resources. Human Resources in Chinatown, yeah. right? Okay, this um, I made in 2006, and it's called Incorruptible Flesh, 
dissociative sparkle. So people could touch me for six hours. Um, it was kind of done as a challenge to the curator of the National Review of Live Art in Glasgow, Nikki Milliken. So she said, will you do a six hour piece? And I was like, oh, you know, I hate durational work. But I thought, okay, fuck it. I'm gonna, you know, reach a little bit for this. And um, I guess I hadn't thought when you do interactive work, you kind of let go of the results because it's, you know, you're, you're working on reaction. So everybody gets new agey and you thought they were gonna be nasty <laughs> or, or more varied you know you have to let go of the results so that that was kind of surprising to me and then I redid it at um, artist space in New York City a few months later and then I decided not it was an experience um, but when I did the fourth part of this series that was the second part um, I did a 20 minute version, which is what you saw at, at HR, right. and that's more like a gangbang instead of, mm -hmm. you know. Everybody somewhere... touched you within a, within a 20 minute Yeah, they window. only yeah. have 20 minutes, so okay. it's like a solid mass of people crowding in depending on how big the performance was. Um, is that, is, does it ever get arousing or have you put yourself in too much of a state? It's like doing porn, you're like split. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you're not in it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just another day at the office? Well, yeah, no, no. It's like, it's like a, there's a schism. Like you become, you're in the action and you're also somewhere else because it, it's all You're actually observing. Authentic. Yeah. So, so what are the, now you've got the wires hooked into you. How many, how many wires are hooked into you? Ten. Ten wires. So that's my kind of facelift wire. Right. And you did something similar with facelifts and I think fish hooks. For solar anus, if I that, remember. That's where this this um, technique came from. Mm -hmm. So if you, said so a you, you, times, you pioneered facelift. this. Yeah, I, I consider it a flesh mask, like working with the mask uh, that we all have. The mask that we all have, and then the you know the sort of um, sacred theater mask, like what masks represent, and just bending the face net. But the the look was inspired from, sometimes I don't care in my research what's true and isn't, but the, and I read four biographies of Marlena Dietrich. And in one, there's a story where, it, the quote comes from Liza Minnelli, where Liza did her first like singing recital, and then um, Dietrich got on stage with her and took a bow, and then she looked over, and there were like two needles with rubber bands on the back of her neck underneath the wig. And, wow. got, and then I think it was her daughter's bio, Maria Rivas, that said, you know, she basically hitch a needle through to pull all that back up, you know, kind of a old facelift gone wrong. And then you put the wig over the needle part. Wow. And you're stapled in place. So I even kind of went further with that in the self-obliterations. You've done stapling work before with your scrotum for certain pieces. I think I saw something at Highways where you stapled your scrotum kind of inside out. Uh, that's called a tuck. A tuck? <laughs> <laughs> I tucked with um, steel surgical staples, yeah. Yeah. So you don't like durational performances? Um, I, it's not that I don't like them. I think um, I'm suspicious of them. I feel like they can be really manipulative. Like this is really meaningful because it's like 48 hours oh, long oh, or whatever. The, the, the only meaning <laughs> is, in, is in the length as opposed um, to the act. And, and yet, I, I don't always like understand what I'm getting. You know, I'll try to, especially if I'm invested in the artist, I'll come back like at three different, really different points and the duration, trying to see what it adds up to. But I, I, um, I don't know, I don't feel guilty to say I don't have the attention span. <laughs> like I don't wanna sit on the floor dewy-eyed watching someone being by being. <laughs> I don't but, get it. But I mean, uh, like historically, there's, there's, um, there is durational performances that, doesn't take, that do not take place in a proscenium. You know, oh uh, no, the, pro properly. But I mean, and durational. I mean, the genre durational. Of course, everything's a duration. But we're yeah. talking about hours and days. <laughs> yeah. and or, Wait, when does it be, when does it officially become durational? If somebody takes fifteen minutes, it, it's I'm going to say not. that exact moment and declare it's always the truth. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing people say: if, if a performance is shorter than six hours, it's not really art. Like, <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'll take. I'll keep that in mind. That's too long a recipe. So what are, what are we looking at here? So th this is still a continuation of that w that story with the needles and the wig story and, and, mm -hmm. and the obliterations I made as I was approaching 50. So um, I want to make a piece that didn't, it's like the wig doesn't mean anything. Nothing means anything, but I tried to articulate an action within that. 
Um, so I call it the self-obliteration. It's a bit inspired by Yayoi Kusama's 60s work. Ah, OK. Um, you, you in didn't have in to concept, be, not you, in. Um, I was going to say you didn't have to get institutionalized for this. No, maybe <laughs> I, more like um, Alice in Wonderland in the park, sort of <laughs> a, a, nudie actions. Um, no, I, I think I was just feeling, it, um, feeling that uh, uh, approaching fifty and like um, creating an illusion, like just to be on, on a box with um, two bottles of fake tan on, like this. I'm just like blonde and tan and nasty. But I found I perform to, to reach some kind of state. So I'm not playing myself. I'm not playing somebody else. But in this one, I, I get to a place where I start moving in a way that I don't recognize anymore. So, so and, I don't, and I'm not thinking off a script. I'm just actually responding. So I tried to set a lot of triggers in this performance to just, I'm either going to make reach that space or I'm not. Most, most people use drugs to get to an altered state. You, you're using performance art to get there. I use both. <laughs> <laughs> that's not together. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That's... But, and you also, I mean, you do a lot of work that involves piercing, cutting, hooking, and suspension. So you are entering that altered state through endorphins and, and, and adrenaline. Well, that, that, those things, you know, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> are the things that fast forward you there. So mm -hmm. I don't need to do a Madonna prayer circle with the cast before and try right. to get tuned in. Like those things just like fast forward you into this, you know, Zen state, I guess, or med deep meditative state. Now you've been at it for many, many years. Let's go back a little. You, you, you started off in Orange County. In Pomona. In Pomona. Nolan, can Is we that, change that's, it? That's in LA County, It's right? the very last place in um, LA County. It's the very last place. Yeah, so the next county is <laughs> Be Riverside. Beyond here lies nothing. <laughs> yeah, beyond there lies Chino. And, <laughs> and so, so, uh, so what were you, 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 did you end up, do you consider yourself like LA though? I mean, you, you, you moved to LA soon thereafter? Or? Well, you know, first going to gigs like in the whatever, like 79, 80, 81 punk scene, I, there was the PA, PAL boxing gym in Pomona. There okay. was the Cuckoo's Nest. You know, there was... Um, oh, the right. Cuckoo's Nest, oh yeah. Pomona's pretty equidistant, maybe even a little closer to Orange County. The 57 straight down, yep. you're right in the middle of it, right? So, um, oh. so it would be either or. So, so maybe we were at the And Cuckoo's then bands Nest. like the Adolescents and, you know, there, there was TSOL presence and and Pomona, and, the, and those people were the audiences at, at the um, premature ejaculation shows of the that was your thing band. that me and Ross you, put together. Do you call it a band? No. It was, it was more just That actions. was a performance action um, project with, with, you know, it was like half noise and half performance. And but you're not even 20, and you're not, obviously you didn't go to like some ridiculous art school to like get uh, inert in this and you were just are you were you making it up as you went along i mean what were your influences? well it's something well the the most local immediate one was johanna went who uh -huh. who was on the scene and you know i, I saw her open for black flag it's like <laughs> breakneck speed with goat heads and suck the eyeball out of a sheep head and kick it aside and then the dildos come pouring out and ejaculating one underneath the wedding dress and it was i just saw a witch doctor and i was like and then by the time Black Flag were playing, I was rolling my eyes up, and <laughs> like it had no effect. I said, yeah. "See, I got my nut already." Wow! wow, um, wow. So that opened up this idea of um, a series of actions that create kind of a trance, or it, like actually goes internal by wiggling with um, I don't know viscera and sexuality in mixed groups. I don't know. There's a lot of embedded things in there. Um, mm -hmm. Also, the sort of um, resonance, I guess, from um, comb transmissions and Herman Nietzsche playing here the, as, you know, oh, documented uh, in desert? things. No, no. Um, comb played in um, LAICA gallery in 77. Wow. And, it, and it's documented, I think, in high performance. And then 81 was also a, down, a downtown gallery that I think Susan Martin produced. So oh, wow. these things have. I, it, it cracked my head open in a way, like how to communicate. And um, I guess, you know, in the 90s, it was all considered abjection. Abjection. Like Christiva. But it, it definitely mode. still came out of that same kind of punk scene thing that, that uh, a lot of people were really just pushing limits. In the artier ends of punk. The yeah. artier ends of punk. Yeah. I think punk gets too much credit. I don't call everything punk. 
<laughs> oh, man. I'm with Genesis P. Orange on that, who also says that. Like, why Pong? It's like bad rock and roll, and it just goes on and on and on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Even when it's only whoa, two whoa, minutes long. No, uh, the dagger is <laughs> so, uh, there's, you know. there's some pretty famous photos of you getting your chin tattoo. What what year was that? It was a, was That's it cherry? in the club fuck era, so that would have been 91. 91? I think it was 91. And, then, and that's um, Sherry Rose and Bob Flanagan? Yeah. And they did a, at, at then, kind of a radical tribal tattoo on your chin, right? Oh, it was Jill Jordan did that, but Jill, Sherry was there taking Sherry pictures. Sherry was there. Uh, yeah. Okay, the pictures are by Sherry. Sherry. Um, Jill Jordan was the uh, tattooist. Um, Bob Flanagan's Nailed, which was the um, launch party for the, mo the research Modern Primitives book, was at Olio Gallery, uh, you know, uh, two blocks from my house, you know, Sunset Junction. Um, and I think that also articulated something in a local scene, like what could happen if someone's, you know, Bob had a sense of humor, reading poetry, like a water thing was filling something up, and then all of a sudden, blam, nailed through the scrotum, and you know, it, it like ch changed the room. Mm -hmm. It does alter. And that was um, 89, early 89. Alters the states of the performer, but also the audience. Yeah. You know. I think that's maybe, you know, when you clue into the, I call it a neurology of how images affect and actions and um, smells even. I, I've done the, the one where I have the wig when I take that off and there's blood everywhere and I like run glass over and that's hanging up. There's so much blood spread out that if it's a close room and everyone's standing close, you start so much blood molecules go into your sinuses that you under, you can almost taste my blood. Mm -hmm. Wow. Does it smell the, like iron? Iron and something musty. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like there's the organic thing. Wow. And then, and it, such an extreme performances unify the audience when you have that collective experience or it, polarizes them <laughs> right, right but i saw your the performance with the wig at a small venue in um like on temple and it was really really powerful and there were celebrities in the audience too and um, yeah. but <laughs> everyone just bad. felt um this connection and i think in that case especially, it was people who really, who knew your work, who cared about you personally, so it was an even more of a, of a deep well, tribal celebration. That was also a um, event that Ju Julie Tolentino and myself curated, right. um, and, and it was very layered. So there was my, what I call self-obliteration one and two. Two is the act of self-fisting with the blood. <laughs> and so to do self-obliteration in tandem with Julie for an archive project, she does called The Sky Remains the Same. So she says, which one of your pieces, if you're going to give me a piece to redo as a living archive? And it's like, how about the idea of a living archive actually mo taking a piece that I'm working on and moving the idea forward by um, breaking down my premise that I'm present in my work, that I have this, um, you know, body that's been infected with HIV since 1986. So 30 years that I'm continuously through my work show myself as a living corpse, as a sexualized corpse, as, you know, like this dynamic keeps repeating. So what if you put it in a, um, a Filipina Salvadorian female body that doesn't have that same exact history? And, and ran it alongside, and it it did twist it. It twisted the concept. It changes the meaning. Yeah, the and, 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 and I really appreciated being able to. We did it um, a couple of times together like that, like where I would go through the cycle, then we'd both go through a cycle together, then I would go on to two. Um, we did that, and then she did um, a movement-based piece. Right. And I, I never, I don't know why I'm shameless. I just got in and did like a dance improv wow. <laughs> piece. <laughs> to, and then, um, then our special guest at that one was my friend Franco B from London, who's a great um, 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 visual and performance artist. And um, Juliana was starting to work with the under, underwater acoustics of, of opera voice. So she did that in a, in a bathtub wow. to, um, to, um, one to three people, so you would have to be the chorus going, uh, you know, like into the water through tubing, but she was like underneath um, starting to learn how to um, take in air while being in water and you singing. 
Well, fish have mastered that, but not, not many mm -hmm. people. So they so, have gills. Well, what are we looking at here? Okay, so the, the, this is what um, I'm working on. This is the writing equivalent of what I'm working on with, um, to, to show in LA, probably in an, a, a full year from now or so. That's, wow. that's Whitworth Hall in Manchester. Okay. And um, it was put on, it was kind of co-produced by um, the Center for the S Study of Surrealism. Oh, okay. Um, so they were having a conference, so that, that was part of that. And in in England? In England, and I also had a producer, so we kind of doubled So you're, and you're looking for like a, a private space to do this in? Or in a private space that's architecturally interesting. Okay. Like that place had a um, massive pipe organ, concert grand piano, it's, okay, and I was so there using was... a musician. Um, Othan Mataragas, a, a Greek pianist for, for that, who's amazing. So what's, what's the least sympathetic audience you've ever had? Have you, I mean, do you usually, do you only, do you tend to perform to the initiated? No, I, I, I mean, I came out of, um, you know, if the 90s work came out of um, nightclubs where people didn't necessarily come to see you. And we <laughs> did the um, two nights in a row, the 5 a.m. slot at Love Ball in Amsterdam, the year Lee Bowery died. So this, the Trojan Whore was a Lee Bowery tribute piece. And, you know, everyone's off their head on E, and all of a sudden the techno stops. And the um, grumbling uh, picks up, <laughs> and you have to really, you know, again, I thought of Johanna, like with a punk audience, like you really have to rise your energy up to top everybody. Wow. And, you know, so the, that's a um, different, I guess, what do you call it? It's like a different adrenaline high of working. Like you have more to overcome than, than um, the seated, polite, or over, overly sincere art audience yeah. that, <laughs> that are, t you know, they, they feel up for it. They know they've done their homework. Do you more often than not win them over? Um, certainly in that era, that, that was my thing. I liked doing both because I didn't feel enough energy. And then as um, I feel like, you know, I've been in a long thread of the last few decades of performance art and, and how, it, how it's evolved. And I think when the academy started teaching it and people you know you think who's who's seeing your work for years if you subscribe to the getting a master's degree to be a real artist um i feel like people will t tolerate the most boring work because uh -huh. it's like they are you're all speaking the same language because you read the same essays etc and and but you're never challenged in that way you just think someone's being cunty if if they criticize you so you, you want to it's the culture of academia that that sort of ruins things not necessarily academic investigations or, or, uh, themselves. or, or, or dull dulls slows down. it down dulls it down um because I don't, I don't think those kind of performances are nece necessarily more um intellectual because I, I like smart work just not smart ass work <laughs> <laughs> so let's move to the next picture on your of, of the pictures we have Ooh, what's this this was one of those um fantasy trips um guillermo gomez pina said um do you want to perform in mexico city because this space is interested in showing your work um so this is 95 um ex teresa which is a desanctioned convent and you know in the socolo just a, just behind wow. in between the national palace and the cathedral like on the the street back so and in um there's two chapels and then a chapelette so he's the big chapel and did martyrs and saints of which of the what i call the so-called torture trilogy it's number one um and then while we reset we hadn't made the third part of it yet deliverance except for some parts so that's alex benny alex benny and julie tolentino on the wall that divides ex teresa from the ruins of templo mayor wow that he did that piece on that wall, so wow. that was. Um, and this is. This is the Judas Cradle, which was um, commissioned by the Arts Council England. Even actually, it was Arts Council England, Arts Council Scotland, Arts Council Ireland. It was like a, a whole. They finally package. agreed on something. Yeah, wow. it was a whole touring package to make this piece with Juliana and I. Sat, stood in the nook of a piano for a year, often at um, her studio near UC San Diego, because she was studying down there. Um, and we prepared this piece. So th that was an experiment. You know, again, she's like a, 
a, a, you know, a, a musicologist and a coloratura soprano, and I, I would sing duets with her with what? my untrained, horrible voice. With your voice. untrained, horrible voice. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I learned scales. I learned how to sing countertenor. I, I muscled my way through an opera. Oh, and um, What a trooper. You know, it was all made of quotations, so we would add non-musical things like Genet text, uh, original writing from Laurie Weeks, um, and then use um, bits from Turandot, you know, using Puccini, yeah. Bellini, um, Ligeti. When you're, when you're <laughs> making stuff, performance art tends to re recalibrate these originals. You don't have to get permission from anybody, do you? No, you didn't call. You didn't call it Jean Genet. Depends on the state. country. Yeah. Some some European countries they always want your set. You know what did you show? Like um, Germany's yeah, one, pretty uptight. Right? Yeah, it was Hamburg where it had a little like weird slow down version of an Elvis song within used inside of oh, another wow. track, and I think they paid a little royalty on that. Yeah, that's the first thing you'll get take, taken down on YouTube is, oh, this is no longer available in Germany if you use <laughs> three <laughs> notes from any popular song. You know, it's like, boom, gone. I know, a computer finds it now. It's like, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it's the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's like, the, the law there is that the performer owns the pictures. So if I take a picture of you performing, you own my images. I, I don't have the right to that sell That has them. a deep logic to me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Where were you on the home taping issue in the early 80s? <laughs> Things change, right? <laughs> so, um, so now this was in England, and you, you were in England quite a while, but you're back in L.A. now. Are you back in L.A. for good or for the... I'm here. You're here? You're here now? You're enjoying it? You're, you're back? I mean, did you leave only for, I want to say, employment purposes, but to no, pursue? No, I... I... I wouldn't have left for that. I, you know, I sincerely got married. Oh. <laughs> to a, you know something that may not be able to happen after Brexit. I married an Argentinian with an Italian passport. Wow. So under the EU mandate of um, of of immigrating, you don't have to prove your income or answer hardly any questions because they have a right as a EU member to have their first family member there. So okay. It's the same as if I was there child or their parent, you know, okay. like first relations. Um, and um, yeah, and I had always worked there. I think um, England was directly, you know, London ICA was giving me, um, was bringing me there and then gave me a commission for deliverance when all, um, when I became blacklisted in the States because of the 1994 Jesse Helms nonsense Ugh. for a system that I wasn't even in. But you know, you get used for whatever. <laughs> that just, you could be used for. Just being on the periphery, yeah. the whole thing is a disaster. Yeah, um, because, um, yeah, taking, taking state money does pollute things or mm -hmm. complicate them if you, if you have to answer because of the 5% you're paying. Was there a time you thought you might never come back? Um, I think I went there pretty open and I couldn't assimilate. Oh, really? I, I just, I won't live in gloom. And you know, and I would joke, oh, this is a culture of misery where cuntiness is a national pastime. <laughs> like throwing darts at bitches when you enter a room. <laughs> but with flair, I think when Americans or, or Europeans try to become Londoners and be really harsh, they, never, they overdo it, and then everyone just hates them. Ah. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you were just too true to California then? Well, I, I, I liked it also, you know, a series of things happened, and these are disastrous things. Like, the minute I was moving there, um, London got the bid for the Olympics. So they, like, cut arts funding 40% uh. to save it up for the big wank-off Olympic Arts Festival. Um, you know, which that changed the vibe of the city, where the only area there were a million giant lofts for cheap was Hackney Wick became... You know the Amish Kapoor Red Ride and oh, <laughs> all man. the all that sort of stuff. Art rooms, everything. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> yeah. so let's see the next photo, please. <laughs> let's see what we got here next. Maybe what's that what's our next oh. photo? Oh, it drops down. Oh, wow. Where was this? This was um down at um Spill Festival in Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Spill and Ipswich and, and London um, uh, artist called um, Robert Pachetti um, started this festival um, 
Anyway, I'd been, I've been working on this piece for all the messianic remains. It's the same piece we were talking about where people touch me for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. but the second part is, um, it's kind of an appropriation of Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising oh, in wow. costume and choreography, but the intention changes using all the text from Jean Genet's um, Our Lady of the Flowers that relates to um, divine dying, divine's funeral. And it's, it's very much um, a development of you as a living God and your immortality. And within performance art, which is so temporary, it's seen, it's gone, except for the photographs and texts that are in your books and the re your book and the reviews that remain. But there is an apotheosis, the, yeah. the development, the self-development of, a, you're becoming a god. So this was the fourth part of the Incorruptible Flesh series, which the Catholic miracle of incorruptibility is kind of defined as flesh that stops rotting. As a, as Most a, of them were nuns, right? Um, like Saint Bernadette, she wasn't a nun. Like she, she wasn't was a just, nun. She just had the hallucination of the walk. Maybe she became a nun when she was nuts after <laughs> seeing the Virgin talking to her in the spring, busted out. I just remember the movie a bit. But I, I did, I did, and in travels through Rome and thing, look at a lot of bodies. Um, and I did a research residency in Glasgow to to start that concept. So are they just? Well preserved. I mean, what's? I mean, the, well, some of them are, are. You know, it's it's the origin of Madame Tussauds. I'm pretty sure you have. <laughs> uh, you have the saints and popes that, like Bernadette, was commissioned by like you know an artist to build this gorgeous wax head that over her remains, and then ones that where they show a little flesh, they're, they're treated with formaldehyde. It's, oh, okay. it's pretty okay. thought like you have the. Um, the tongue of San Antonio inside these gorgeous golden vessels. So even though it's a piece of jerky, <laughs> it's well presented, which, you know, that's nine tenths of everything. It's presentation. <laughs> we live in the drive-by city. Everything's facade. It's, oh, yeah. it's just as real as, as touching it. <laughs> so, um, but so this, this kind of Egyptology, I don't know, going from this like Catholic marriage to like, well, if it's alive and it's sexualized and I've been working on it for 20 years, it must be going through like apotheosis and, and a kind of, let's say, a, a way that I think would be true to the way Kenneth Anger used rituals in his film, not, not in a didactic, I'm actually creating a ritual circle. But artistic to get somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, can we, can we see our next image? Ooh, what oh. are we doing here? Yeah. Ooh. Are those heels? Oh, yeah. Is that Solar Anus? Yeah. <laughs> that was great. You know, I went on a date. I uh -oh. took a date to uh -oh. Solar Anus, and I ended up marrying the guy. Because I thought, you know, if anyone, like, what a perfect first That's date. That's a testimony. And yeah. you had a failed marriage as well. Well, no, it lasted seven years. Well, seven years is a success in success. LA. Success. And, you know, he was really blown away by it. He, because he's an actor, he saw the underlying themes that you were working with and it impressed me that he sat through it because he was like a pretty square dude you know and um it was actually one of my favorite pieces of yours because it's so beautiful where, where did you perform this um the one in the photo or in general well, the, the one that lisa took her date to <laughs> oh was that at highways no it was it was i think it was on the west side it was on the east side oh, it wasn't at highways. oh i did do i did do a building that was downstairs from Al, Al's bar. There was a gallery for a while. Oh, at yeah. A corner glass spot. Okay. Yeah. Which and I, it was, now I don't even remember what it was. It was but. downstairs, and you were wearing, your shoes had black dildos on the end. I so, th I, yeah, these were different shoes because this is later. Mm -hmm. I, I did those performances, but I made it in 98 and um, premiered it, you know, in Slovenia at the end of the year and, and probably did it in 50 cities. Or 25 or something. Right. It's, it's the most toured piece I did because it was my first solo. I, you know, I, you could call for the elaborateness and the amount of people in the 90s work I did. Um, it had a, a stronger relationship to theater, and so the, when I wanted to do a solo piece, I was really afraid to just, you know, it's used to Las Vegas. So all of a sudden, like. I made a sling chair that someone told me looked like a Zimmer frame. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I really did hardly even get off the seat after, a, after an intro, a walk-on. Um, and 
I think I made the entire piece in two weeks. Like it was just, oh. it had been brewing for a long time. When I read um, the George Bataille essay, The Solar Anus, which I think is from like 1927, um, I wanted to get a solar anus butthole tattoo. So I just thought about that until I met the right person to tattoo it. And then um, seeing the action photos of um, Pierre Molinier, which I would actually travel to see shows initially. Um, when I first found out about him, um, that inspired the action. So it just by the time I decided to make the piece. Um, and how many times did you per, how many times did you perform it? Um, at least twenty five. Wow. And, uh, Around through, the world. Yep. Wow. And okay, so let's let's move on because I know we've got some other great. Oh, okay. Can I just talk oh, about please, this please, one? Please, the, yeah, make, 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 make. The. Um, so I think I finished it in about 2002. I tend to show a piece for three years and just keep um, changing things and finishing things till it's done. Um, so 2002, I put it away. But in 2007, the Hayward Gallery in London was having a show, um, Undercover Surrealism and the Visions of Georges Bataille. Wow. So Lee Adams produced an event within that um, called Monster in the Night of the Labyrinth. So, so. Um, we worked with a few other artists and had an evening of short performances of which Boom. this was. You were able month. to revive it, no problem. Yeah, great, great. Nice. So next up, we had your book. Uh, a, a cover, of, the cover of your book is the next image. Can we get the next image? There we yeah. go. Pleading in the blood, uh, um, which I worked. Dominic Johnson edited that. We worked on it for a couple of years. Um, I think. It changed me doing that, and I knew it was going to, so I was really resistant at first to live in my archive and retrace steps. And um, social media like Facebook was invaluable to finding like 80s photographers. Wow. There's people I would have never found. Wow. <laughs> so you were actually able to do I was doing shout outs, I was even doing fact checking on there. Like, this one gig, you know, like <laughs> a, a people are just beyond the curtain that are still alive sometimes. You can put it out there it's like somebody and know you know somebody will reach them if they're not reading it themselves and now out of all the images you've done the cover um, can we take a look just at the cover I, I, I'm just at, why do you pick this one I, I thought it just was the strongest single image that um, could you know also to not use a full body on the cover uh -huh. but, but to be more up close and personal like that mm -hmm. I just think it captured that moment where I turn into this like lizard Dietrich. <laughs> well, and it has so many different parts of you. It's got the crown. It's got the the tattoos are shown. The makeup, the thea theatric. The, I'm having trouble speaking today, but it's just it's a beautiful image, and it shows. And now it's the by um, Regis. And this Regis is still, her trick. This is still available on Amazon. You think? Oh, it is. Oh, it's a, it's available now there's on a, Amazon. Amazon. Well, I was really um, stubborn that it had to be a hardback. Okay. That's the first print run. Like, um, why well, have a book now? I, <laughs> it, it ha books, I have a, fe a fetish for books. I love books. I, I love hardbacks. I like a little bit larger print. And so I resisted the paperback. Um, the second issue is out in paper book, and it's actually only a tiny bit smaller but you can actually use it, like flip can, it. Yeah, there's, there's a functionality. Yeah, there, you right? can yeah. get through it to these <laughs> weird chunks. Thing. Is that about two thirds of the way through? Whereas the hardback, it's like slow as Moses, like picking mm -hmm. up 10 pages at a time sort of thing. Well, to wind down, because we could probably talk five hours with you. What, what question do you get asked most often that we have yet to ask you? Don't ask me about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, okay, which, which tattoo was your first tattoo? Oh, my my very first tattoo was this cross on the middle finger, the middle finger. which I handpicked wow. myself. Wow. So, I, so I left the cross, the star, and the tear. Wow. And then the first shop one was in in '82. I just went. I went to Cliff Raven, who you know was like a. I looked young for my age. I was like baby Huey, and I didn't have a tattoo except for a couple of handpicked, and I wanted this spider on my head. So finally, I, I went to a few shops, and some looked a little bit like their work was crappy. I was already snotty, even though I didn't have one. <laughs> um, and then Bob, Ro you know, I, Bob Roberts was setting up spotlight tattoo 
uh, oh, like wow. near Melrose and Vine. And um, yeah, he said he would do it. And, you know, we started a long relationship between, you know, Leo Zuluato came to that shop. Um, those days and were crazy. Leo's, like, did he do the tribal? He, he did my arms. Alex okay. Benny did most of my tattoos, and who's in London. Okay. But he was here, married to Elaine Benny for a while. Um, but in those early 80s days, they, we would have these evenings at Spotlight. Like if like Hanky Panky was in town, Ed Hardy would come down from San Francisco. It would be like you know the early legends of custom tattooing, and they would like show us a slideshow wow. of new designs <laughs> and then the kind of neo tribalism, of course. Dan Tomei, who did hand picked tattoos, so that was a small scene where you got a there was a lot of attention given to to educating yourself on what you might want. Is it is it a little depressing, or that that tattooing is just so mainstream now? Is I mean, I don't know. Honestly, even if it had stayed edgy, if you could just keep a boner over a tattoo forever, like yeah, I'm a fucking tattoo, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't mean anything anymore. But but nothing means anything anymore. Fair All enough. like signifiers that said, you know, it's been a long time that dreadlocks don't mean Rasta. That, you know, et cetera, Gang, gangster don't mean cholo. You know, you can go through long lists of the, of it's things. all been thrown in a blender. The meaning, the meaning is just dissolved. So you see, yeah, the, you know, I don't know. I don't feel territorial about it because it happened so slow. It, you know, the mainstreaming of tattooing. Yeah. I mean, um, piercing a little different, like people, because you can just take them out and get a little, I never got the derma abrasion, but you can erase yeah. the holes. Um, so they just go through different types of people. You know, it, so they kind of get fresh again. It's just, it's a tool of expression. I guess I, I don't make it something super, super special, even though at one time it was. It was, it meant something, and, but yeah. you, you, you can, it's, it's like you just grow, you go on and, and I wherever go on it goes, and maybe, goes. you know, when you talk about, you know, the way we can accuse artists of gentrification or whatever, like I, I was key in gentrifying tattoos. Oh, no. <laughs> I remember an essay that you wrote for the LA Weekly about facial tattoos, and it still stands out in my mind. And you said, you know, how you'd been turned away from rentals because of your facial tattoos. And at the end, you said, unless you're me, don't get one. Who do you think you are, me? Yeah, that. Yeah. I, um, well, but it's so easy to get a tattoo, you know, you could, and, and back then you needed to go through like 20 laser sessions to look like hamburger, right. <laughs> and now it's, you know, you go through three sessions and it's almost 100%. What? So we're going to check out the sketch now. Ta -da -da -da. From the sketcher's seat, Aliza has sketched you, Ron. Here we go. I like that I look trim. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> you do look trim. Can we get a close-up of, of Ron and the sketcher's seat? There we go. All right. Ron Athey, thank you for being on Modern thank Art you. Blitz. Thank you, Ron. We thank do this you so much. Every you, Sunday, Ron. live at 5 on DroneBox.com. We're archived on DroneBox.com and at ModernArtBlitz.com. It's like dueling websites. Uh, we'll see you next week. A special thanks to my lovely co-host, Lisa Derrick, and... Uh, of course, our intern, Eliza, and our guest, Ron. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bravo. Woo